everybody. Welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Got a great show for you tonight. We're going to be talking all about headaches. So stay with me. Whether you suffer with migraine headaches or cluster headaches or tension headaches or stress-induced headaches, this is the show you're going to watch from start to finish. I'm not only going to be talking about what creates and what causes these different types and styles of headaches, I'm also going to be talking about natural solutions that you can use and implement at home and hopefully toss at some point in your future, toss the need for, you know, for harmful pain medications that might, uh, you know, that might create other side effects and other untoward problems. So stay with me. If you're new to the show, let me know where you're tuning in from. Say hello. Don't be a stranger. Say hello to the folks in the feed and uh, just let us know where you're chiming in from. And as always, make sure if you're tuning in and you haven't already subscribed, if you want to see more, hit that subscription button down below. Now, let's dive into headaches. So right now, many of us are going through, you know, what I like to call COVID stress. And so that COVID stress, you know, for a lot of you, it's really hitting the noggin. COVID stress, and so it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on with COVID, whether you, some people call it a plandemic, some people call it a scamdemic, some people are hiding in their houses and closets, some people are hiding behind masks. It doesn't matter where you fall, stress is stress. And so it's all stressful. So whatever you choose to believe about COVID, we know, we know at this point, the stress, the social isolation, the other things that it's creating, we've seen uh, especially in my practice, we've seen a, a mass increase in folks dealing with headaches. So there's three, really four primary types of headaches. We're going to be focusing on several of them here, but let's just kind of outline it for you. There's stress headaches. Now, a subtype of stress headache, stress can induce the three major forms of headaches. So we've got stress that can cause tension style headaches. Stress can also trigger or be a trigger for migraines, and it can also be a trigger for what are called cluster headaches. Now, there's one other type, prim primary type of headache. Uh, stress doesn't play so much of a role in, so we'll kind of put it in its own, and that's sinus headaches. And these are kind of basically, sinus headaches are more of a pressure headache. If you've got like a sinus infection or something along that line, for example, it creates an increased mucus production inside your sinus cavities, which creates a pushing effect or a, a physical, if you will, a physical uh, effect and creates an external pressure on the head. So that um, can lead to a sinus type headache as well. This is very common. This type of headache, very common around allergy season. So if you suffer with allergies, uh, particularly environmental allergies, pollen, dust, mold, dander, that type of thing, uh, seasonal ragweed, et cetera. This is where that sinus issue can come in. But I want you to remember too, that just because it's an environmental allergy um, doesn't mean that it can't also be a food allergy triggering the same issue. I get a lot of people right now with food allergies that actually have sinus headaches that are caused by their food allergies because their response to foods they're reacting to is the same as the response for environmental antigens that you might get exposure to. So keep that in mind too. The reason I point all this out is because here's what we know. If you go to the doctor, let's just move this out of the way here. If you go to the doctor, right, and you're, you're, you're seeing that doctor and you're saying, look, doc, I've got a headache. Generally what's going to happen is you're going to get some type of prescription. And it doesn't matter which one. If you if you have a tension headache, for example, what you're typically going to get is some type of NSAID, non steroidal anti-inflammatory. If you've got a migraine headache, you're generally you're going to get uh, one of the migraine based medications, something like a Topamax. If you've got a cluster headache, oftentimes they're misdiagnosed. And so you get the same kind of medication or you also get an NSAID. And then if you've got a sinus, you generally you're going to get some kind of antihistamine. This is the standard of care, right? Just across the board. So, you know, how many of you tuning in tonight watching, how many of you been to the doctor for a headache? And this has been the course of action that was recommended for you. If that's the case, just type in yes. And let's just see how many of you tuning in tonight have had this, this very, you know, same type of experience. Um, 
as well. So I want you to understand that it doesn't matter whether it's tension migraine cluster or a sinus headache, aside from stress, which again, if you're, if you're dealing with this right now, this is a trigger. So it's not a cause as much as it is a, a trigger. So by itself, stress is generally not the only thing. Triggers, think of triggers as um, as, as the perfect storm, it's when you have multiple things that are going wrong simultaneously that all kind of convene and lead to together, lead to the outcome of a headache. But in and of itself, by itself, oftentimes triggers aren't enough. Well, stress is usually not the only trigger. It's usually stress is present with a number of other variety of different factors and triggers, and we'll talk about those too. But again, you go to the doctor and the general rule of thumb is and this is what I've, I've, I, I hear all the time, at least from people that come into my, to my practice, is they tell me, I went to my neurologist, I went to my GP, I went to the pain specialist, they gave me medications, and they told me the diet had nothing to do with the headache. And again, fill in the blank, didn't matter which kind of headache, whether it's tension, migraine, cluster, or sinus, sinus headache, and that diet completely plays zero role and, and headache is a myth. Diet plays a major, major role in headache, and we're gonna dive into that a little bit too. And I'll talk to you uh, as well about the top nutrient, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, as well as the, the, the vitamins and minerals that help with headache, but also talk about the, the top foods that actually trigger these types of headaches. So stick with me, we're gonna get to that. So again, if you've been to the doctor, this is generally the course, now, the, pro the, the problem is we'll get to in just a minute is if you're being prescribed a lot of these medications, they deplete iron and B vitamins. And in the case of like aspirin, we, we even deplete vitamin C or in the case of something like Tylenol so that you could be on something like Tylenol or acetaminophen, right? And that depletes glutathione, it, deplete, it can deplete vitamin C, which are also notorious nutrients that, that when given can actually help with headaches. And then antihistamines can reduce, a lot of people don't realize this, but reduce your, your stomach acid. Uh, but antihistamines also suppress your immune system, but that's, you know, for another day. But if you're worried about COVID, suppressing your immune system is probably the last thing that you really, really want to think about doing. But suppressing your acid leads to protein malnourishment, leads to B vitamin deficiencies, especially vitamin B12. And so as we'll get into that in just a minute, you'll understand why, that, why that's very important to know. So let's kind of move over here. So we're going to talk about some of these major, major triggers and so this, this diagram here that I'm, that I'm referring to um, is discussing, let's, let's see, let's put this in front. There we go. So this diagram, it says common migraine triggers, but it's not really, this really could say, doesn't have to just say migraine. It could just say headache triggers, common headache triggers. And so this is, think of this wheel as just kind of an example of a number of the different things that we know that can contribute to headache progression. And so just going around this list, we've got nutritional deficiencies, which we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about here in just a minute. We've got hormone problems. We'll also talk about why that's the case. Allergies, and this could be, you know, again, what I said earlier, this doesn't have to be just environmental allergies. It can also be food reactivity. And then gluten, this is not so much an allergy as it is a sensitivity. So when you think about gluten, a lot of people think I'm allergic to gluten. It's not the same thing. An allergy and a sensitivity are very, are very different, at least biochemically speaking. But a lot of people are gluten sensitive, and that can be a major, major trigger for migraines. Gluten's a neurotoxin, so it can trigger that neurological response. Alcohol can do it. Uh, sinus pressure or sinus... Uh, sinus compression or sinus, um, again, sinus pressure. And that, I, as I mentioned earlier, these two kind of go hand in hand because allergies can oftentimes create the sinus disturbance. Caffeine is a known trigger for migraine. Dairy products, and one of the reasons this is kind of similar to gluten is that a lot of your dairy products mimic 
can mimic gluten. If you want to learn more about the connection between dairy and gluten, you can check out uh, one of my videos on gluten versus dairy. Very helpful in that regard. And then processed foods, and this particularly with processed foods, you'll see a lot of these things have correlation. So processed foods oftentimes contain chemicals, but one of the big chemicals they contain is MSG, which is one of the most notorious headache triggers. Uh, artificial sweeteners as well, oftentimes found in processed foods. So again, you're gonna see some overlap on this wheel. Muscle aches or muscle tension or muscle spasm. Now this is one of the most common triggers for a tension headache, but it can also remember tension and stress can actually be one of the triggers for migraines. So what happens to a lot of people is they start off with a tension headache and then it progresses. Once it starts, it progresses toward triggering a migraine. We mentioned stress earlier, sugar. So, you know, going back again, look at all the links to processed food and then environmental stress. So there's a difference between emotional stress and environmental stress. And so environmental stress, think about emotional stress as you're hanging out with people you don't like, you have a job you hate, you're, you know, you're, you're surrounded by people that you don't get along with. And so there's this emotional grief or emotional strife versus like, let's say an environmental stress, and this could be physical stress. So for some people it's exercise. I've seen exercise induced headaches as a result of overdoing it. Physical work is too great. And then we've got chocolate. And, uh, and one of the things I didn't mention that but we talked about dairy mimicking gluten, but we didn't talk about tyramine. There's a, there's a chemical in dairies, particularly in cheese. And so some of your aged cheeses because of tyramine can be a major trigger uh, for migraine headache, but also for other styles of headaches. And then chocolate as well. There's a, there's a chemical in chocolate called PEA, um, which in caffeine as well. So PEA and caffeine are both triggers for headaches. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's overlap again between several of these. And so the correlation is, is strong between a lot of these. So again, these are very, very common migraine triggers. Now here's why I show you this wheel. I want you to kind of use this wheel to your advantage. You can print it out if you'd like to. And I actually, um, I have a, um, we'll have in the show notes below the video, we'll actually have a link for you that you can follow. And in that link, you can get an actual copy of this digitized and you can save it to a thumb drive or you can print it out. But one of the things it has is it has all the research and medical references. And the reason why I want you to have this, I'm skipping a page here, that's this section right here. So these are your medical references is I want you, if you're struggling with headache issues and you've had conversation with your doctor, whether that doctor's your GP, your neurologist, whoever it is, right? Your PCP, whatever you've got uh, that you're working with. I want you to be able to take this to them and say, look, we haven't investigated any of these things and you've got me on two, three, four medications and you want me to mitigate this pain with drugs without actually investigating any of these potentials. We always want to start, this is the fundamental premise of headache investigation, is always start, always start with triggers and causes, okay? So very, very important. So that being said, let's talk about some of these, some of these uh, dietary triggers. I'm gonna show you some research here because again, I want you to be able to, to take some intelligent information to your doctor. Because a lot of times, well, my opinion is if your doctor is not willing to look at this and you're probably seeing the wrong person and you need to maybe get a second opinion, but this is coming directly from the medical research, right? We've got Journal of Pain Research. You see dietary trigger factors of migraine and tension type headaches. Okay, so this study was done on 684 patients. What they found, okay, what they found is that in 390, they had 319 migraineurs or people with migraine headaches they had 365 tension headache patients. And uh, what they found is that 23.1%, so a quarter of these patients, one of the triggers for their headache was missing or skipping a meal. Now that doesn't mean that if you fast, that fasting is somehow bad, but what's wrong with a lot of these people is they're chronically sick and they don't have a really strong ability to regulate their blood sugar. So missing that meal for some of them creates what's known as a hypoglycemic state. So if you're pre-diabetic or your doctor's ever said your blood sugars are low and then high, you know, fasting might not be the right move for you until you get that under control first. But almost a quarter of these individuals had missing a meal as a potential trigger. 
So that's not a, think about that for a minute. That's not eating the wrong food. That's just not eating. That's missing a meal and then ha not having the ability to regulate your blood sugar as being a culprit. And then you can see here that 37.3% of them, so almost 40% had dietary triggers. So that's a big chunk of folks, right? Struggling with headache where if we go again, if we go to the gold standard in medicine, gold standard is what? You walk out of the doctor's office with a prescription drug, okay? I just showed you that almost half of all, all headache sufferers, at least from this particular study, had food as a trigger. What were the foods? Women, don't hate me, please. I'm just the messenger, don't shoot me. Chocolate was one of the major triggers. Coffee, food rich in MSG was a trigger, okay? Uh, soft drinks, and this has to do with going back to our diagram here. What are, how can we correlate this information to this diagram? So you got, again, you've got chocolate, you've got coffee, you've got, uh, which again, down here, caffeine, but also uh, some of the other ingredients in coffee. And then foods rich in MSG, again, your processed foods. And then, so the reason why I'm pointing out some of these things, but not all these things, this is a long list of, of potential triggers, is, is something in science called a p-value. You see this number up here, it's called a p-value. What does that really mean to the average person? P-value means the strength of the evidence. So the lower the value is, so if this number p-value is less than 0 0.05, that makes this a very, very, um, very, how do we wanna put this? Very scientifically valid association where the higher the p-value, so if it's above 0 0.05, then the, then the strength of the evidence is a little bit less. So in this case, again, chocolate, coffee, MSG rich foods, soft drinks and instant noodles were the things that had the greatest degree of evidence against them. So what's interesting about instant noodles is that they're a major source of MSG. If you ever went to college and had ramen noodles, you know, every day for, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner, um, again, major, it can be a major, major trigger for people's migraine headaches. So that, and again, soft drinks, as I mentioned earlier, I mentioned the, um, the, artificial sweeteners being a common ingredient in soft drinks. If we look at this other study coming out of the journal headache, okay, you can see here the conclusion was that certain foods, beverages, ingredients within foods may trigger attacks of headache and or migraine in susceptible individuals. Elimination diets can prevent headaches in subgroups of persons with headache disorders. So again, I'm not just kind of bringing this out of thin air and saying, listen to me because I'm right and I'm Dr. Osborne. I'm showing you the experts, the big experts publishing in the major journals are agreeing with me. And if we look at this particular trial was studied. Now this was a small trial. It was done on a small quantity of people, but look at the statistics of what they found. And this was in a modified Atkins ketogenic diet, which is basically uh, gluten-free. Okay, and so we observed for the first time that a three-month ketogenesis ameliorates clinical features, uh, clinical features of a chronic cluster headaches. It's not just about migraines, it's also about cluster headaches as well. So if your doctor's diagnosed you with cluster headaches and he says, oh, diet has nothing to do with cluster headaches, again, it's very, very common for those words to come out of a doctor's mouth. This evidence would show otherwise. Look at, look at what happened. Okay, so they, in this study, here's what they, what they looked at. They, the results of the 18, so there were 18 patients in the study, 15 were considered responders to the diet, 11 experienced full resolution. So in this, again, a small study, we need more studies to reconfirm this, but more than half of the individuals in this research study had full remission, okay, full resolution of their headache, and four had a headache reduction of at least 50%. Well, those are great odds. Those are great statistics. That's, that's um, a pretty powerful, pretty powerful dietary intervention. And, and so the, what was it? There was no treatment. What was the treatment? You know, if you wanna call diet change treatment, you can, but there was no medicinal treatment. There were no herbs, there were no drugs, there were no um, medications that were given. It was just strictly a diet change. Again, very, very powerful. Okay, let's talk a little bit. I want to dive into some of the nutrition 
on this as well. So a lot of people don't realize this, particularly a lot of doctors don't realize that there are different triggers uh, or different chemicals associated with an increased risk of headaches. One of those happens to, to be nutritional deficiencies. So if we look at in this you know, review article, vitamin supplementation is a prophylactic treatment against migraine with aura and menstrual migraines. So ladies, if you have headaches around your cycle, here's what these researchers and, uh, and, and authors are pointing out. Number one is that an increased level, now you've heard me mention this chemical before, of homocysteine. Homocysteine is a, is a metabolic byproduct. We all make it. It's like, a, it's like human exhaust. It's a, it's a chemical that we all make, and it's a normal chemical, but if we make too much of it, it actually can trigger migraine headaches. And so what this review was aiming to, to show was that if you could, if, if you had a person with migraine headaches and you measured their homocysteine level and it was elevated, then you could use B vitamins as a tool to lower the homocysteine, to bring it down. And then that would lead to a reduction in headache. So again, homocysteine being an independent risk factor for the development of migraines, um, if, you, if, you, if you knew this, if you know this, you, again, you can take this to your doctor, say, doc, measure my homocysteine levels. If they're high, I wanna consider using B vitamins to get them down and see if that doesn't affect my headache. Now, what B vitamins help to lower, to help lower homocysteine? Which ones help do this? It's vitamin B12, it's folate, it's vitamin B6 and it's vitamin B2. Those four B vitamins have an effect or an impact on helping to lower homocysteine if homocysteine is over elevated. And as a matter of fact, B vitamin deficiencies can cause an elevation in homocysteine. So in those cases, you know, this is, you know, what we're, re what we're referring to in those cases where people have a major issue. I want to come back to this diagram because I want to point something else out. Let's just move these over and out of the way. So one of the, look at this list. So these are all triggers. As I said earlier, these are triggers. Okay. And we said earlier, we said nutritional deficiencies. So we can put down here now, we can put B vitamins. Okay. Bs. And, but what on this list, if we were to look at it, what on this list do we know can actually cause deficiency of B vitamins? Okay, so, right, we know that alcohol can cause a deficiency of B vitamins. We know that hormones, women that are on artificial estrogen, so hormone replacement therapy, we know hormone replacement therapy can cause B vitamin deficiency. We know gluten-induced GI damage can cause B vitamin deficiency. We know that caffeine can cause B vitamin deficiency. We know that highly processed food that's loaded with garbage can contribute to B vitamin deficiency. We know that stress can cause B vitamin deficiency. We know that sugar can cause B vitamin deficiency. So all that being said, Going back to what I just showed you, which is homocysteine elevations have been linked to migraine headaches because of B vitamin deficiency. Many of those triggers, and we're talking about, okay, why are they triggers? Well, one of the reasons why, not the only reason, is that they can contribute to the B vitamin or the nutritional deficiencies. And so again, anytime a doctor tries to tell you that headaches have nothing to do with your diet, either, either you know, set them straight and show them this and, and have them work with you to measure or fire them and get with another doctor. Now, I wanna point out a couple of other things from this particular review article. So you can see here, um, there are some individuals that have, for example, a genetic variation in something, well, let's highlight that because we're gonna cover it up a genetic mutation in something called MTHFR that stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's an, it's an enzyme that helps to methylate your folate, which is a B vitamin. And so again, that helps you 
to metabolize properly homocysteine. So some people have an MTHFR mutation that can contribute to an elevation or an increased risk for an elevation of homocysteine. But that's not all. We, remember I told you earlier, this was also talking about menstrual migraines. And so I wanted to point a couple of things that, oops, I wanted to point a couple of things out that happen that can contribute to the menstrual migraine. So one of the things that happens around for a, whim, a woman's cycle is an increase in what are called prostaglandins. And so that's what you're seeing over here. So you can see here, it says that the menstrual migraines on the other hand, associated with an increased prostaglandin levels in the endometrium. Now increased prostaglandins are inflammatory and so they can trigger a migraine or they can, they can trigger a headache, a cyclical or cyclical headache. Now, one of the things that helps to control an increase in prostaglandin biochemically is vitamin E. And this is why vitamin E is oftentimes used um, in, in situations where people are struggling with headaches, women particularly around the menstrual cycle. Vitamin C can also be used in that regard for helping with that. So vitamin E and vitamin C, according again, according to this review, also helpful uh, for migraine, but also for a menstrual migraine. So ladies, if you struggle with, you know, with episodic periodic migraines that come right before your cycle, you want to understand that, that uh, this information could very potentially change that for you. So highly recommend you look deeper into this. Then we have magnesium. Magnesium as a nutrient. Okay. So you see your research on magnesium has found it to be a potentially well-tolerated, safe, inexpensive option for migraine prevention while it may also be effective as an acute treatment option for headaches, including migraines, tension type headaches, and cluster headaches, particularly in certain patient subsets. So again, this, is, this information is, is, could be very, very valuable. If you're struggling, if you're on medication, you've never heard this before, I would highly recommend at the very least have the conversation with your doctor and potentially look toward nutritional supplementation to see whether or not uh, you get a, re a reduction in your symptoms and your headache occurrence, frequency, intensity, because otherwise you're just really all you're left with this medication, which is not a great solution. It's not a great answer. Now I got this diagram here for you. I, I kind of summarized this and again, research studies and references. If you want to read more about it and you want to download this information, you can go. I'll, I'll put that link in the show notes for you. But these are a lot of the nutrient deficiencies that are linked to triggering headaches. So we've got, again, vitamin B12, B6, B9, uh, and B2. So these are the, remember these ones here I said earlier, I said these ones are linked to homocysteine. And so those four, those B vitamins all help with lowering homocysteine naturally. Now, some people have genetic mutations that can affect the way these B vitamins work, and that can put them in an increased risk category for the development of headaches. But these B vitamins are very critical. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of research, particularly on vitamin B12 as a migraine prophylactic. And so what a prophylactic means is that it's a nutrient that's used once the migraine is kind of starting to come on, it's used to kind of stop that, or it's used as well as a preventative. So some people take B12 on a regular basis to prevent migraines from happening as frequently. It's actually, there's a lot of research around vitamin B12 and doing that. There's also a lot of research on magnesium as a migraine prophylactic and on vitamin B2 as a migraine prophylactic. So if we're talking about nutrients, B2, B12, and magnesium probably have some of the better research on prophylactic use. There's also something, it's an herbal, it's called feverfew that some people will also use as a migraine prophylactic as well. You'll oftentimes see formulas that are for migraines like nutritional support formulas that contain B2, B12, magnesium, and feverfew as ingredients. And sometimes you'll also see CoQ10 added in those as well, because there's research that shows that CoQ10 can also act as a prophylactic. So if we talk about why some of these things, uh, some of these things are 
how do they actually help? Like what's, what's the, the mechanism? There are several different mechanisms. So as I mentioned earlier, some of these B vitamins have a mechanism, actually this moves over, of homocysteine. But um, what about CoQ10? CoQ10, you need it to drive mitochondrial function. And so your mitochondria are what actually give your body the ability to produce energy or ATP. And so there's some research that shows that migraines particularly can be triggered as a result of the inability to generate adequate energy. And so the nerve uh, in the blood vessel starts to malfunction, triggering the migraine. But also this can be also found true in, in uh, kind of your tension or your stress base. So tension, we'll, we'll use the term tension headache. What is a tension headache, right? This is more kind of muscle related and CoQ10 deficiency causes, as a side effect, causes myospasm, which is, you know, muscle spasm. So we got CoQ10 deficiency can contribute to muscle spasm. Magnesium deficiency can create or contribute to muscle spasm. Calcium deficiency can contribute or create muscle spasm, leading to increasing the risk for the development of tension headaches. And so what, what works great for this, and so a lot of people will seek out kind of therapeutic treatments. So they'll go see, you know, for this, they'll go see massage or they'll do chiropractic care or they'll do physical therapy or PT or they'll do yoga because yoga is relaxing or they'll do meditation because meditation can help calm the muscles down or they'll drink things that uh, reduce like valerian or passion flower teas, things of that nature where muscle spasms can somewhat be reduced. But I would say if you're, if you're low in nutrients, why, why, okay, nutrients, the reason I always, you always hear me harp on nutrients, why? You'll hear me always harp on nutrients more than I harp on anything else, and that's because they are essential. What does that mean? That means without them, your body can't function. That's why they're called essential nutrients. Okay, so I'm not opposed to any of these things. I think all these things are wonderful. I think chiropractic care is fantastic. I get adjusted once a week. I think massage is, is fantastic. I think PT and yoga and meditation and relaxation techniques are all wonderful. But none of these things will correct a deficiency of a nutrient. Remember, nutrients are essential. These things are adjunctive. So these are, these are add-ons. These are things that can be very helpful. But if, you're, if you have a nutritional deficiency, these things are going to give you temporary relief because if, if these things are the real true origin or cause, again, temporary relief, this is where it's at. This is why I harp on this first. So again, I'm not against these things. And I think a lot of people really benefit greatly from these, but start with nutritional essentials. And if you're still struggling, you feel better, but you're still struggling. Then you bring in these adjunctive or add on therapies, because sometimes these are helpful to kind of break through. You might have muscle adhesions. You might have an imbalance in your spine that needs to be adjusted. You might have super tight muscles because you've been deficient in magnesium for five years and didn't really figure it out until you asked your doctor to run the test. And so all these things, remember, they all work together, but this stuff right here is essential. It's primary. It's, it's kind of the, the, the basis or the foundation for trying to figure out what's contributing to the problem. And if you don't address these things, then these things just become, they become aspirin like they are helpful they reduce the pain but they don't really solve why the pain is there and what we're after is we're after a solution we're not after a temporary feel good so uh, again with with tension headaches this is a particularly true calcium magnesium iron deficiency can also create muscle spasm i didn't point that out a minute ago because iron deficiency causes anemia that anemia leads to oxygen reduction in the muscle when the muscles don't have enough ac oxygen, they go into a spasmodic state. And as I mentioned about these two, these can help with hormones and hormone regulation. Okay. And then these ones all play a role in that homocysteine connection. So these are all nutritional deficiencies that if you haven't yet, if you struggle with headaches, again, doesn't matter whether it's cluster, whether it's homocysteine or, or not homocysteine, whether it's cluster, whether it's tension, 
or whether it's migraine type headaches, you want to definitely have these investigated. Now, I'm going to dive in a little bit more to something I haven't talked about yet, at least not to a great degree, and that's the sinus headache. Now, I mentioned earlier sinus headaches are oftentimes allergy based, meaning, and so again, I said that most doctors will say it's seasonal allergies. So this could be outdoor allergens, but this could also be food allergens or chemical allergens or chemical exposures. And so those are important to look at too. So if you struggle with chronic sinus headaches and you're on allergy medication and you're still struggling and you've had this done, you've had your doctor, your allergist has run outdoor allergens. You could, okay, so when ragweed's high, you stay inside, but you still struggle. It's time to look at food. It's time to look at the potential for chemical reactivity as well, because these can also create a sinus headache. The other thing I've seen commonly create a sinus headache are yeast and bacterial overgrowths in the sinus cavities. Very common to see that. And so what this will, what this will do is this will create increase in mucus, it will increase inflammation, and that will lead to a headache. And so what a lot of people will do, not knowing, because they don't know they have these issues, uh, and what, one of the big ones I see is this one right here is the yeast. And the, one of the reasons why is so many people are put on antibiotics, and one of the side effects of chronic antibiotic use is yeast overgrowth, and that includes in your sinus cavities. And so if you have been to the doctor and you know they've said, yeah, you got a sinus infection. 99 times out of 100, in my experience, they'll never culture you. They'll never run a swab up deep into your sinus cavity to see whether you have an infection. They'll assume you have an infection. They'll give you an antibiotic. You might have a yeast infection. The antibiotic doesn't do anything, doesn't make it get better. The yeast persists and gets stronger, and this can grow year after year after year, creating persistent headache. And so what happens with the sinus headache over time is it reduces the surface or the, it reduces the space in your nasal cavity. So it reduces really more than space, it reduces airflow. So when you're trying to go to bed at night, what you suffer with is an apnea. I get this all the time. People come to me, yeah, my doctor said I had sleep apnea. What do they do? They put you on a CPAP machine what happens with a CPAP machine? They get really, really dirty and they generally harbor yeast and bacteria. And so sometimes what happens, people on the CPAP do a lot better. CPAP can work really, really well, but over time, it just re-inoculates them, recreating the problem. And so you can see it just becomes a vicious circle. And I want you to understand that because the CPAP generally, again, is to force airflow to improve oxygenation when we're sleeping. But if we can re improve airflow by backtracking here in the first place, in other words, figuring this piece out, then you may not even have a true sleep apnea. You may just have a reduced airflow again as a result of the uh, increased mucus and inflammatory production by these two elements. So very important to ask your doctor to check that out. So if you struggle with headaches and you have sleep apnea, this may be part of the issue. Now, what I have seen uh, work really, really well for some folks who struggle here is if you've ever um, nasal rinsing. So you could use like a neti device, like a neti pot. You could also use like a hook nose bottle where, where you can control the, 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 the fluid flow. But using this with like a saline solution, a lot of times will help flush out the sinuses which can help to increase airflow and reduce apnea. But again, even this is not a solution if the problem is yeast and bacteria or food allergy. As I said earlier, if you have a food allergy, all you're really doing with that food allergy is you're creating, you know, with a food allergy, these same two things happen. So maybe what I should do is draw an arrow here and, and show you that mucus and inflammation are also a side effect of food and chemical reactivity. So again, maybe it's these things, maybe it's this thing. In my opinion is you should have your doctor rule all of those things out to ensure that you're approaching 
this from the right angle because headache is one of the most common reasons people will visit their doctor. It's, I think it's like of every seven doctor visits in the world, in the United States at least, uh, one of those seven visits is for headache pain. So it's one out of seven visits. Um, so it's a pretty prevalent, pretty, pretty common thing. So all that being said, we've talked about the relationship between migraines and cluster headaches and sinus headaches. Uh, we've talked about tension headaches to a certain extent. So all of these things we've talked about, we've talked about what can contribute to them, what can create them, and what are some of the solutions for them. Now I want to open it up to any questions that, uh, that any of you have tonight. So let's dive right in. Okay. Why is it I prevent or get rid of a migraine with carbonated water? Um, so that's a great question. And I, I honestly, Juan, I can't answer that question. I don't know why carbonated water helps get rid of your headache. Um, I haven't heard that before. That's, that's a first for me. A, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. Ayo, hi. Um, how do you know if your microbiome is good or if you have a leaky gut symptoms or tests? Thank you. So the testing for leaky gut. Now, leaky gut can be a trigger as well for migraine headaches. We really didn't talk about that as a trigger. But if you come back over here and we go back to the kind of the wheel here, one of the, one of the correlating themes behind this diagram too is remember that a migraine as a whole, let's just kind of move this stuff out of the way. Um, as a whole, a migraine headache is leaky brain. And so what causes leaky brain, generally speaking, is leaky gut, like if we're oversimplifying it. And so if you are, are at, this, the question is, well, how do we know what causes leaky gut? Well, there are a number of different things that we that we are certain can cause leaky gut. Gluten, probably the most well-researched and most well-studied, but, but the testing for leaky gut. So coming back to the testing, how do you know if you have leaky gut? Um, there's no great test for leaky gut because they can give you a lot of false negative types of results. There's also false positives on leaky gut. So the best way to really test for leaky gut is to test for the triggers of leaky gut. Let me see if I can, I might have an old slide for you if I have it in my in my old bin here, I might or might not have it. Oh, I don't think I have it. Sorry, maybe we'll have to look at it next time. But um, I have a diagram. If you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, um, there's a nice little chart in No Grain, No Pain that talks about the 11 different primary causes of leaky gut. And the way we would want to identify leaky gut is to identify whether or not you have any of those 11 triggers or causes of leaky gut. And if you do, then, then you can be assured that leaky gut is most likely a problem for you. Hence, or subsequently, leaky brain is, is kind of the next trickle step in that direction. Okay, let's see here. So, yeah, so Ellen says, um, my parents both had migraines. Both said drinking coffee helps with their headaches. At least one, if not both, were gluten, were gluten sensitive, but didn't know it. They both had very similar health issues. It's one of the unique things about caffeine is caffeine, interestingly enough, can actually, if you ever see, there's a medicine on the, on, over the counter called Exed, uh, Excedrin with, with, with uh, it's migraine Excedrin. So it's, it's a migraine formula. And one of the ingredients, aside from non landing inflammatory, is caffeine. And so for some people, caffeine can actually reduce headache. Now there's, there's different fields of thought on this and that caffeine can reduce the headache, but some people also believe that caffeine withdrawal, because one of the things we know about caffeine withdrawal increases headache. And so what happens is some people, maybe they get on a, maybe they're trying to be healthy. And so they're, they're going and they're doing a caffeine withdrawal because they're cutting coffee or they're cutting heavy caffeine out and they start to develop more headache. And then they find that just a small cup of coffee helps to reduce that headache. And that's because of that potential for caffeine withdrawal. So caffeine can kind of play both sides of the fence there. 
Uh, Diana, Diana says, I have MTHFR and take a homocysteine supplement and feel better. Thanks for sharing, Diane. Um, Amali wants to know, what's a good level of homocysteine? So yeah, so homocysteine, if you're looking for a, a good level of homocysteine, you want to have it less than nine. That's kind of what you're looking for. If it's not, if it's not under nine, it's probably a little bit too high. And that's where some of the increased risk can start to set in. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody says, uh, greetings from Portugal, a conversation with my doctor. I don't think so. If I had a doctor, it would be someone like you. For now, 59, I am my own doc. And sometimes that's the way it's got to be, folks, because, you know, I don't disagree. The conversation with the doctor, most, most doctors... At least in my experience, most doctors of the people that come to see me um, have a track record, at least according to the people coming to see me, of spending less than five minutes with them. And that's part of the problem is you can't really, you can't be a great doctor and not listen and not learn and not understand a person's story or history. It's just, uh, it's not really all that possible. Uh, Kelly wants to know the best supplemental form of vitamin B12. Um, two of my favorites, Kelly. Um, one is called homo, or it's called um, methylcobalamin, and we can post that up for you if you'd like. You have to be real careful if you're using this as a supplement, as a lozenge, or a sublingual, because you, what you want for best absorption is sublingual. It absorbs through your cheeks, it bypasses your intestine. One of the problems with people with vitamin B12 is their history of gluten exposure has damaged the part of their intestine that absorbs vitamin B12, so they don't absorb it very well. So sublingual can be a better form for many. But for as far as I'm concerned, as far as I've researched, almost every sublingual on the market has corn, major corn ingredients. So we want, we want something that doesn't, and that's where methylcobalamin comes in. We use actually, instead of using corn, we use cherry. Um, to, to sweeten it. So it's direct uh, organic cherry or acerola that, that we use as, a, as an agent to help with that. So that's methylcobalamin. The other is something called B-complete, and it's got a mixture of all the B vitamins in it. Now, it's not a sublingual, but it does have methylcobalamin. So it has this form of vitamin B12, which is one of the better forms of vitamin B12 for most people uh, in terms of how, what, the, what your body uses in order for, uh, for proper metabolism. Uh, let's see. Headaches occur after you run. Any thoughts on that? So lots of thoughts on that. Depends on how far you run, how aggressive you run. Um, and But it also depends on what you eat and what you drink and how well you're hydrated. So it might not be the actual running. The running might be the proverbial straw, if, if you will, that, that breaks the back, right? And that, and that you have to do these other things before you run to, to not have an issue. I would say going back to kind of if running is the trigger exercise can be aggressive exercise can be a trigger of, of permeability of, of uh, blood brain barrier permeability and leaky gut so that may be part of what you're experiencing um, so looking at some of these other triggers and cofactors that we talked about tonight might solve your problem um, let's see what can i do to stop or lessen the loud ringing in my ears Depends on what's causing it. So, so for some people, the ringing, the tinnitus, I've seen that go away with a gluten-free diet. For some people, I've seen parasite be the cause of ringing in the ears or tinnitus. For others, I've seen it be that they've just listened to loud or been exposed to loud music or loud machinery for so many years that they have inner ear damage to their vestibular cochlear nerve, and you're not really going to see that improve all that much. So it just depends on what category you fall into. Um, electrolytes, very important. So Crystal wants to know, what about sodium or electrolytes? Yes, electrolytes are critical for, especially for migraine and for tension headaches, because a lack of electrolytes can actually lead to muscle spasm, which is, again, it's a trigger to tension headaches, but also a trigger to migraine headaches. But you also need electrolytes to control neurological function. Remember, one of the, one of their two main thoughts on how migraines trigger, one of them is a neurological trigger and that neurological migraine triggers can be caused as a result of, of uh, dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. So electrolytes play a major role and you should be hydrating very, very well. 
So headache with a strobe light of, so not sure I understand your question here, but if you're referring to headaches that occur with a strobe-like effect, so you're having like a strobe blinking effect in your eye, in your visual fields, um, if that's happening to you, those, if, in my experience working with people, the most common uh, trigger for that is coffee. Coffee and chocolate, which again, I, I said earlier, ladies don't hate me um, because most ladies love their chocolate, but um, that strobe type of symptom is a is a oftentimes present as a result of consumption of those two foods, at least in my experience. I uh, hope I answered your question. My wife is postmenopausal. She gets headaches in the back of her head where her neck meets the skull on the right side. Um, Lance, I would definitely, you know, I would consider, you know, taking your wife to a really good chiropractor and having maybe an x-ray done and a full workup done where you can get rule out any kind of physical issue um, because with, with headaches, they can be physical or chemical typically uh, or emotional, right? Emotional stress, but physical as in physical abnormality, muscle shortening, muscle imbalance, muscle tightening, vertebral misalignment can all be part of that headache trigger. Uh, but biochemical, meaning electrolyte imbalances, calcium, magnesium deficiencies, nutritional deficiencies, things that we've talked about tonight, but a good chiropractor can rule out the physical aspect. And once that's done, and, you, and, 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 and if there is a physical issue and treatment is, is, is implicated and treatment helps, then you have an answer. But if it doesn't help, then you can go toward the biochemistry side of things. Uh, let's see. So Sheila wants to know, I've had migraines off and on as a child, but chronically since 99, numerous triggers, including stress, heat, smells, physical activity, and working. Can my gluten intolerance and thalassemia be the cause? Yeah, gluten intolerance is one of the biggest known causes of migraine headache. Gluten's a neurotoxin. There, there are a number of research studies that show that one of the manifestations of gluten sensitivity is beyond celiac disease. So many of you, you know, many of you maybe been taught that if you don't have diarrhea or gastrointestinal symptoms, that gluten is not the culprit. But one of the side effects of gluten sensitivity is migraine headaches. And that's, that may be all you're having. That may be the only side effect that a person can have. So absolutely gluten can be the trigger there. Um, whether it is or whether it isn't, I, you know, it's hard to say the best way to know or to help you determine whether going gluten-free is right and we'll put a link below this video, um, is, is you can take a quiz on gluten sensitivity to see if going gluten-free might be a good move for you, or you can do genetic testing for gluten sensitivity, which might also be a good idea. And if you're interested in that, I can put a link up for with more information to genetic testing on gluten sensitivity for you. Okay. So clearing mucus, Linda wants to know what's the best way to clear mucus. One of the great natural ways to clear mucus is NAC. Uh, so NAC is, let's see, let's get rid of this, make some room. NAC, N-acetylcysteine. sometimes referred to as NAC. This is a great mucolytic. And so it helps to clear out mucus really, really well. And it's a dietary supplement. It can be bought over the counter. I have something called Ultranac that can be used. It's very, very effective on mucus. Marie wants to know, can sleeping too much um, 10 plus hours trigger a headache. Yes, it can. Oversleeping can be as detrimental as undersleeping. And one of the reasons why oversleeping for a lot of people anyway is position. Positional relationship is so lying in bed, being sedentary too long can create more tension. It doesn't sound like it should because you're resting, but what happens a lot of times, depending on the positioning of a person's pillow or the comfort of their mattress, can actually put the neck in a compromised position for a longer period of time, just depending on how you sleep and how sound you sleep um, and how much you toss and turn. 
Let's see, Dickerson wants to know the dose of B12, how much B12? So there are a lot of different strategies behind dose, but it's a real safe place to start with methylcobalamin is 5,000 MCGs a day. Uh, very safe. Remember B vitamins, there are no known reported toxic side effects of at least of vitamin B12. Of all the B vitamins, vi probably the one that you got to be the most cautious with is vitamin B6. But even, even with that one, it's very, very low risk of toxicity or low side effect profile. Okay. Any diet to help reduce inflammation? So Joy... No grain, no pain. It's the best diet in the world to help reduce inflammation. Um, if you don't have a copy, go pick one up at, at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Um, super easy diet to follow uh, for reducing inflammation. Okay, what benefits do you see from a weekly chiropractic adjustment? Um, what benefits do I personally see? Better mobility, better range of motion, uh, reduced risk of injury, increased neurological flow to the body. You know, chiropractic adjustment has a lot of benefits to it, um, but, but um, I see a lot of really great personal benefits from it. What about smoke or air pollution in the area and having to wear a mask? So we didn't really talk about that tonight. And I, some of you get mad at me when I talk about masks. Uh, so, I, but I love the question. Um, so one of the big triggers right now for headaches is the mask. Mask increases headache for several different reasons. Number one, um, the mask itself reduces your oxygen capacity and reduction of oxygen or lowering of, of oxygen actually is a known trigger. And so, so masks in that way, if you're a migraine sufferer, that might be uh, a medical reason why you shouldn't be wearing the mask. You know, you might talk with your doctor about, uh, about a medical exemption around that right now. Um, but one of the other reasons is the materials of the mask. The materials, a lot of these masks are not you know, they're not made in the most pristine of conditions, but then on top of that, they're sprayed with chemicals. These masks contain a lot of different chemicals in them. And so you might be, you know, with that mask on your face all day long, breathing in the chemicals, plus breathing in your own carbon dioxide over long periods of time could contribute to being a trigger. But then even beyond that, you've got, um, one of the other issues with masks, if you're wearing, so some of you are buying these medical, like these, these medical masks um, that, that are throwaway one-time use type of masks, but some of you are buying like doing your own thing with cloth. So what kind of cloth? Is it, is it artificial? Is it, is it natural cotton? Is it organic cotton? You're putting that right in your face. If it's not organic, are you breathing in other chemicals with it? What do you wash, wash it with? Okay, what are the what's kind of detergents are you using? Are you potentially allergic to the detergents, the dyes, or the colors? Again, depending on what you're using, maybe you're using all natural things, so this is a better way to go and, and less of an issue of a risk for the trigger. But if it's not, you know, again, a number of the chemicals, um, the chemicals, air pollutants, perfumes, dyes, etc., can be migraine triggers. So you definitely want to watch out for that. Great question, Marianne. Let's see here, um, how to reduce yeast in the body. So, you know, again, earlier I mentioned that yeast could contribute to sinus issues. So if you're trying to reduce yeast, one of the best ways to reduce yeast is to consume a diet that is somewhat carbohydrate restrictive. Remember that yeast thrive on sugar and carbohydrates. So if you're trying to get rid of yeast, if we wanna reduce yeast, we're going to reduce carbohydrate. Now, what does that mean, reduce carbohydrate? We're looking at probably 50 grams a day as the, as the ceiling, right? As the top level of what you want to do. And, and when you start getting over that 50 grams, you really start providing a substrate for yeast to thrive and grow with. So um, you want to look at, 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 at this. And then you might also look at some natural antifungals. 
if you're just talking about supporting your immune system um, and the ability to, to kind of regulate this a little bit better. So things like caprylic acid or oregano can be helpful. I have something, it's a mixture of, of different herbals called yeast shield that you might find helpful in that regard, but you can use this to kind of balance, keep yeast in your body at a better balance. So yeast shield is what I would recommend. The other thing that you can do is a good probiotic, a competitive probiotic. And what does that mean? One of the best competitive probiotics for yeast is, um, well, I've got one called Biotic Defense, but I've got actually a few different ones. Biotic Defense with S. Bilardi, which is an ingredient that really helps to compete with yeast a little bit more aggressively versus kind of some standard probiotics. So those things are all kind of tips, things that you could do if you suspect uh, a yeast imbalance. I love it. Margaret Ann says, uh, our migraines have gone way down since we've been on a true gluten-free diet. Love hearing that. Love hearing those testimonial stories. Okay, let's see here. The Oh, well, let's see. What do you do to get rid? Okay, we just talked about that. So May also asking the same question about what do you do to help with the yeast and sinuses? That strategy might work. Um, again, I would also recommend like a neti pot strategy for that too, because sometimes you get you get it you can get yeast overgrowth deep up in the sinuses, and to drain those sinuses out and help flush them out can be very very helpful. Uh, we talked about dehydration a little bit. So dehydration can cause headaches as well. And so this part, this part of what we were talking about with electrolytes and that kind of balancing your water balance. Now, if you use this kind of water, RO water, and you drink this explicitly, you should know that you want to remineralize it or you want to add electrolytes back to it. Um, and that can be very helpful because it, otherwise what might happen is you can actually... Uh, especially if you're sweating a lot, if you're a heavy sweater, you can you can begin to dehydrate by drinking RO water if it's not being remineralized. So this is very important if we're talking about hydration. Now I have something called ultra electrolytes, which is a seawater concentrate with trace minerals and ultra trace minerals and, and electrolytes that can help with RO water. And kind of the way you would use this is you take a half a teaspoon with 20 ounces of water so for every 20 ounces of water, you take a half a teaspoon in it. If you Again, if you're drinking explicitly that reverse osmosis filtered water. Um, okay. Alina wants to know, will this be available to watch again? So much information that I want to listen again. Absolutely. Alina, make sure you subscribe. Uh, as we get ready to wrap up here, make sure you subscribe. There's a subscribe button. Also, make sure you come visit us at Gluten freesociety.org. Sign up for our newsletter. It's free. If you sign up, we're going to give you tons of wonderful information about natural health, but pertaining also to the gluten-free diet. But you'll also get updates when these videos are ready for replay. So we have an entire video library with more than 800 videos, thousands of hours of information, uh, health information packed uh, in these in these 800 videos that you can access. And there's no charge for any of that. It's all free and it's all there for you to peruse through. So yes, it will be available, but make sure you subscribe so that we can update you when that, when that happens. Okay, it looks like we're out of time, folks. We covered a lot of information. The questions didn't stop as usual. Look, if you um, have a question, you want to get that question answered, there's a couple of ways to take care of that. Number one, show up here every Monday night at 6 p.m. We have a show every Monday where we do a live format just like this, where you have the ability to ask your questions. Again, the quicker and the sooner you ask your question, the more likely you're going to get it answered by me. But additionally, don't forget to email me. Look, we want to take care of you. We want to help. We want to be a resource in your community, a resource for you. And so you can email me at glutenology at gmail.com. So if you shoot me a question or you shoot me a topic or something you'd like to see me cover in a future show, we, we look at those, my team and I look at those, we review those on a weekly basis, and we, um, we generally try to get to as many of them as we can. So 
Don't hesitate to reach out to us via email as well, glutenology at gmail.com. Look, it was great to spend my Monday evening with you. I hope this was super helpful. Make sure you help me help others. If this was helpful for, for you, make sure you share this. Remember, our goal here is to help save 100 million lives. Hashtag save 100 million lives. That means I need you to hit the thumbs up. I need you to hit the love button. I need you to take this and share this to as many platforms, friends, and family members who you think would benefit as possible. The more we share it, uh, the more it gets out there. The more this information becomes less of an uncomfortable conversation, the more health becomes the common as opposed to health becoming kind of the rarity. Right now in our society, health is a rare thing and it's very, very common to be sick. And so most people look at you as you're trying to go down your health journey like you're a health nut, like you're crazy, when reality is they need this information. So the more we can normalize the social paradigm behind how important this information is, the more we can normalize health as being the great place to be and live. So with that in mind, make sure you share with as many people as possible. We'll see you next Monday night, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Have a fantastic week. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.